Special thanks to Stumbling Tours super sponsors Schumann 3D Blast, Shine Wolf, Ministry of Ennui Control, Metric Conversion, Thingy, Lemon314 and Lord Entropy. Visit David X Newton on Patreon to join the ASCII Brigade. One of the many things that I noticed I was particularly bad at, compared to the games that I saw from other people playing Open TDD, was getting towns to grow. Over the course of the game, I knew the small villages that I began with would put down more roads and houses, eventually becoming slightly less small villages. But occasionally they would also transform into bustling cities for no reason that I could gather. It's in your interest to plant stations in places that will become heavily populated as soon in the game as you can, because the more buildings near your stations, the more passengers and cargo will become available to you. After a look at the code, it turns out that the player has much more influence over the growth of a town than I thought, so here's a look at when and how a town can grow. First of all, I'll need to talk about how time is measured in the open TDD world. The most basic unit is a tick, and all the game logic is built on this period of time. A tick lasts about 30 milliseconds, and every time a tick passes, the game world is updated in some way. Most things in the game don't happen on every single tick, so a lot of the activity is to tell each object to count down the number of ticks until something happens. A tree might get one tick closer to growing, or a bus will tick down towards its next inevitable breakdown, and so on. Every 74 ticks the game advances the date, so each day lasts about 2.2 seconds. When the month rolls over, which happens every 62 to 68 seconds of real time, the game will call Town's Monthly Loop, which will perform various actions to update the state of towns. One of them is Update Town Rating, which I brought up in the last video, and another is Update Town Growth. There are two elements which Update Town Growth needs to decide on. The first is whether the town is allowed to grow at all over the next month in a flag sensibly named Town is Growing. The second is, if the town is growing, how long there should be in ticks between times a town builds a new part of itself. This is the town's growth rate, and somewhat counterintuitively for something called rate, the higher this is, the slower the town will grow. Town is growing is the blunter of the two instruments and is based on a list of conditions. First, if the game setting for town growth rate is none, the town sensibly won't grow. At the other extreme, if the town has had a custom growth rate set, then the town will always be allowed to grow. This never happens under normal game circumstances, but custom town growth rates can be set via scripts or console commands. The code then looks at any special circumstances that are imposed by the game's climate. The code is set up to allow this to be customised with new requirements and types of cargo, but only two of them exist in the original game. If you're playing in the mountain climate, towns above the snow line will be shown as requiring food. This requirement is fulfilled if the town accepted food at any station at any point during the previous month. The amount transported doesn't matter, and anything above zero is enough no matter how big the town grows. The most obvious cargo to transport to fulfil this requirement is the one literally called food, but curiously the fizzy drinks cargo from the retina bursting toyland scenario is also set up to count as food. Fortunately, it's unavailable here, so you can't have whole towns wiped out from tooth rot and blood disorders. Finally, if the town's population is 90 or below, then it's exempt from the food requirement, but a town has to be absolutely minuscule for this to happen. If you're in the desert climate, then towns on the sandy zones will require water in addition to food, using the same kinds of rules as for the mountains. Again, any non-zero amount of water delivered within the last month will count, and this time there's no possible substitute. In the desert, a town with a population of 60 or under could still be allowed to grow without food or water, but it would have to be positively subatomic. If these requirements have been fulfilled, the town finally checks the number of stations that are active, which once again means they've accepted or loaded cargo within about the last two minutes of real time. The actual timing is 20 cycles of the time between assessment of the station ratings, which happens to be every 185 ticks, so this works out to exactly 50 game days or 111 seconds. If there is at least one active station in the town, the town is set to grow this month. If there are no active stations, then the town will usually not grow this month, except in a 1 in 12 random chance where it will decide to grow anyway. 
You can see this effect by opening a lot of town windows and looking at the growth information on the bottom line. On towns that have their requirements satisfied and active stations in them, the town will always be growing, but even on those without any transportation, you'll occasionally see the town is not growing line changed to saying the number of days between town growth. Once again, I've messed with the copy of the game I'm recording to display another couple of internal values which are usually hidden from the player. I can see the exact growth rate of the town in ticks here where they're usually only given in days. This period of time is also decided by the monthly town update in a function called update town growth rate. This function produces a time measured in town cycles, which are 70 ticks long due to how the original Transport Tycoon game had 70 slots in memory for towns and rotated between them. The base number for the growth rate of a town comes from a hard-coded table called Grow Count Values, which represents the number the routine will start from depending on the number of active stations in the town. With five active stations, we start off with a growth rate four times faster than with just one station, bearing in mind that the lower this number is, the better. After five stations are built, no further stations will accelerate the growth of a town further. Oddly, if the town has zero stations, the growth rate is actually numerically better than it would be if it had one station. However, this is more than balanced out by the way that if a town has zero stations, it only has a 1 in 12 chance of growing at all during a given month. During its occasional growth spurts, it gets a slight boost over a constantly growing town with one station. Having got this number, the game then looks at the town growth speed setting, and will divide the value by 2 repeatedly for every setting above slow. Therefore, towns grow on normal at double the speed of slow, on fast at 4 times the speed, and on very fast at 8 times the speed. After that, a special condition comes in. As unfair as it is, some towns in open TDD are just born with unspoken advantages. When the map is generated at the start of the game, there's a chance that any randomly generated town will be designated as what the code calls a larger town. These are the ones that get shown to the player with the word city in the town list and information windows. If the town is a city, then it not only starts off with more roads and buildings than its contemporaries, but it will have double the speed of growth, as the growth rate value is halved if the town is a city. The chance that a town has to be granted city status, as well as the starting size of cities compared to other towns, can be altered in the game settings. They default to one out of every four towns being a city, and them starting off twice as large as towns. Finally, the growth rate we've worked out is given one more boost, or reduction depending on how you look at it. It's divided by a number that starts off at 1, therefore not doing anything, but adding 1 to the divisor for every 50 buildings the town has. This means as a town accumulates more houses, it accelerates in growth. We now have the number of town cycles that the town needs before attempting to grow. The game now checks if it's above 930, which is impossible at this point because the worst starting value is 420, but nevertheless the game will make sure it's capped there. It will then add 1, multiply it by the ticks per town growth cycle, which is 70, and subtract 1 to give the final growth rate in ticks. Slumberweed here, for example, has a healthy and barely justifiable 5 stations serving it, which gives it the best starting value of 100. Town growth rate in this game is set to normal, so it's halved to 50, then it's halved again to 25 because Slumberweed was lucky enough to be assigned city status. There are 100 houses in the city, so we divide by 3, starting at 1, then giving 2 more points for 100 houses. Rounding down, because we're doing integer division, this gives us 8. Then we add 1, multiply by 70, subtract 1 again, and arrive at 629, just like the computer already worked out for us. Over in Quackgate, it has two stations, which gives it a starting rate of 300, and that's halved due to the 10 growth rate to 150. It isn't a city, and it only has 31 houses, so it gets no further bonuses. 150 plus 1 multiplied by 70 minus 1 gives it the much slower 10 growth rate 10569. All of the above instructs the game how often the town should grow, so now let's look at the mechanism to act on those figures. Along with the growth rate and flag, each town has a variable called grow counter which acts as a countdown. On every game tick, the function called town tick handler is called, and if the town is growing flag is on for a town, it will decrement the counter. If as a result of this the counter drops below zero, that's the signal that the town should attempt to grow. The precise mechanics of town growth are complicated enough to defer to another video, but they're based on starting at the town centre and working outwards. The process begins with the function called GrowTown, whose first responsibility is to find a road to start searching from. 
Beginning from the tile that marks the town centre, it will query it and the 12 tiles around it in this sort of spiral order. As soon as it finds the first road in one of these tiles, it will finish its search and will immediately move to the next phase, which is in the function Grow Town at Road. Grow Town at Road noticeably doesn't grow the town at the selected road, it uses the tile passed to it as a starting point, and will then follow the road, turning at junctions at random until it either hits a dead end, runs into itself, finds a suitable site for a house next to the current square, or reaches the end of a road. In the last two cases, a house or road will then spring up in the chosen tile, and the growth will be counted as successful. If the route fails to find somewhere to build, the search is performed multiple times with different random paths being chosen in the hope that it'll have more success next time. Eventually, it will either build something or give up. However, if for any reason the town didn't find a road anywhere in its central 13 tiles, such as an underhanded transportation company deleting the town centre, then it will perform the same search through those tiles again, this time looking for the first tile that is on flat land, does not already have a building on it, and that the town is allowed to clear. If it finds one of these, it will put a road down on it, randomly either a curve or a straight in any direction. It will then count this as a successful town growth. If that fails as well, and it can't find any suitable town to build a road, then the game will justifiably give up at this point and won't grow the town. If you feel the need to, this means it's possible to forcibly prevent a town from expanding further by cutting out the centre and building over it to make sure that it can't build any more roads on the core 13 tiles, but I can't imagine why you would ever spend the effort. Once the Grow Town routine has finished, the town's Grow Counter will be reset back up to the growth rate so that it can count down again to the next attempt to grow. If the town's attempt to grow was not successful, then the waiting time is capped to a maximum of 70 ticks for next time, so that the town makes another attempt in just a couple of seconds. There's one more option that I haven't touched on yet, but that can have a dramatic effect on town growth. If you're filthy rich enough, in a town's local authority window, you have the option to fund new buildings. Doing this will instantly boot the grow counter down to below 140, and will set a property on the town called Fund Buildings Months to 3. While Fund Buildings Months is above zero, the game will use an alternative table as the starting point for working out the town's growth rate. This adjustment can alter the results dramatically, as the funded starting points can be two or even three times as good as the unfunded ones. Funded towns also get to bypass all sorts of things that are usually requirements for town is growing. They're exempt from any cargo delivery conditions set by the climate, they don't have to have any active stations in them at all, and they even get to bypass the town growth rate game setting if it's set to none. When funded, a town in a game with no town growth rate will grow at the same rate as a funded town with the option set to normal. If the fund building's month's counter is above zero, then it's always decremented at the end of a calendar month, not one month after you happen to click the option. Option. Therefore, to get the most for your money, it's worth using the funding option as close to the start of a month as you can. Looking at this code, and knowing what I do now, has made me rethink a lot of my strategy for the game, making me realise how important transport within towns can be. Previously, I'd thought a town would be helped much more by longer haul services to its neighbours, but it turns out a pair of bus stops that ferry one passenger to the other end of a hamlet to visit her mum twice a month is much more valuable to a town's growth than a mainline station that drops 150 tourists off. Another discovery is that as long as there are fewer than five stations and the town has the population to provide the passengers for it, combining stations puts you at a disadvantage compared to standalone ones, because the bonus to town growth is per station and not per route arriving at that station. If you're building a new route to a town with existing passengers and mail services to drop coal off at the power plant, you'll help yourself out by making it separate and not just adding the line to an existing stop. However, you can't spend all your money setting up five bus stations in every town on the map, because the maintenance costs for them will outweigh your profit. You need to strike a balance of using small road routes to encourage towns to grow, so that you have more passengers and mail to make profit on the larger train or air routes. To find that balance, I think I'm going to have to take a look at station catchment areas, and the number of units of passengers or cargo that you can expect to get there. I hope you'll join me then as well. Thank you to everyone on the left here for supporting me creating Stumbling Tours videos. If you'd like to join in or make suggestions for other games to cover, please have a look at David X. Newton on Patreon.